Nama Kirtana. This was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj. His song he requested his devotees to sing when he was departing the world. Yasomati Nandana. Yasomati Nandana Brajavara Nagara Gokula Ranjana Ha 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 Hey, so Nandana Brajavaran Hagara O cool Ranjana Ha 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 na Gopi Pananandanam Hadhanam Manoharam Gopi Pananandanam Hadhanam Manoharam Kali Adamora Hey, ha 
Amal Hari Nam, Hami Abhi Dasa Ha Ha Govind Madhav, Namanita Thakara Jamuna Tata Chara, Gopi Rasanohara Shri Aadu Baba Lava Vrindavana Nathavara Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Ram Rama Hare Hare Hey Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Ram Rama Hare 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 Nethai Ghor Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Hari Bhav Nethai Ghor Hari Bhav Yasomati Nandana Brajabada Nagara Gokula Ranjana Kana Krishna Get a bravo pod key guy. These are simply the, the names of the Supreme Lord in his pastimes with his devotees in Sri Vrindavan Dham. <clears throat> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Beginning Chapter 3 of Canto 2 entitled Pure Devotional Service The Change in Heart This is text number 1 Sri Sukha Uvacha Eva meta nigaditam Pristavanya bavam mama Nirmaya mridya namanam Manu yesu manishinam Sri sukha uvacha Eva metan nigaditam Pristavanya bhavan mama Nirmaya mriya mananam Manu yesu manishinam Sri sukha uvacha Eva metan nigaditam Pristavam ya bhavan mama Nirmayan mriya mananam Manu yesu manishinam Yeah, 
Ladies, <laughs> Anyone else? <clears throat> Sri Sukha Uvacha. Sri Sukha Deva Goswami said, Evam so, etat all these, nigaditam answered, Pristavan as you inquired, yat what bhavan your good self mama unto me nirnam of the human being yat one vriyamananam on the threshold of death manusyesu among the human beings Anishinam of the intelligent of the intelligent men. Translation. So Sugadev Goswami is responding to Maharaj Pariksit. Sugadev Goswami said, Maharaj Pariksit, as you have inquired from me as to the duty of the intelligent man who is on the threshold of death, so I have answered you. <clears throat> Srila Prabhupada's purport. In human society, society all over the world, there are millions and billions of men and women, and almost all of them are less intelligent because they have very little knowledge of the spirit itself. Hmm. So here's the qualification of intelligence to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, then that's the first thing you have to learn. Before you look, know what you should be doing in life, you have to understand first who you are. If you think you're something other than who you are, then the activities you do based on that misconception of me, they're all useless because you're acting out of ignorance, not knowing who you are and what is your purpose. And Prabhupada makes a very clear statement Unless you know who you are, you are considered to be without intelligence. <laughs> okay. Almost all of them have a wrong conception of life, for they identify themselves with the gross and subtle material bodies, which they are not in fact. So he says, you're not the material body, and this is a fact. It's not a discussion point, it's reality. This has been proven and it's been mentioned by the, even by the Supreme Lord yourself that the living entity in the material world is my part and parcel, not this body. <laughs> they may be situated in different high and low positions in the estimation of human society, but one should know definitely that unless one inquires about his own self beyond the body and mind, all his activities in human life are total failures. Not failures, but total. <laughs> so the beginning of human life means to inquire, what is the purpose of life, who I am, why do I have to die, why do I have to suffer? All of these questions are given by persons who actually have their best interest. Therefore, out of thousands and thousands of men, one may inquire about his spiritual self and thus consult the revealed scriptures like Vedanta Sutras, Bhagavad Gita, and Srimad Bhagavatam. But, in spite of reading and hearing such scriptures, unless one is in touch with a self-realized spiritual master, he cannot actually realize the real nature of the self. 
so we can come in contact with the books, we can read the books, we can get an understanding of the actual truth, but we can't come to the level of realization, which is the principle of knowledge. Knowledge is divided into two categories, gyan, theoretical knowledge, and vigyan, which is that knowledge which is realized, or the complete, it's called vishishtagyan, or that knowledge which is intuitive. It's an experience. Knowledge becomes an experience rather than a philosophical concept. <laughs> so, but simply by reading books, you get the theory and the idea, but the next stage is to find out how to practice the books. And that's where the spiritual master is needed. So, so and out of thousands and hundreds of thousands of men, someone may know what Lord Krishna is in fact. But in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter 20, verses 122 and 123, it is said that, that Lord Krishna, out of his causes of mercy, prepared the Vedic literatures in the incarnation of Vyasadeva for reading by the intelligent class of men in human society, which is almost totally forgotful of the general relationship with Krishna. Even such an intelligent class of men may be forgetful of their relationship with the Lord. The whole bhakti yoga process is therefore a revival of our lost relationship with the Lord. This revival is possible in the human form of life, which is obtained only out of an evolutionary cycle of 8,400,000 species of life. So we think, yes, we're, we're human beings, there's so many human beings, and life is, you know. But according to scripture, and also by numerical calculation, the human form of life is extremely rare. Not just rare, but extremely. It takes many, many millions of births in other species of life to actually come to the stage of human form of life. And to come to an advanced stage of human life. For instance, it says that one who takes birth in India, in Bardvarsha, the word Bardvarsha is used, and then they have a, a high birth. That birth is meant for self-realization. Nothing else behind that. So, not only human life, but birth in the culture of spirituality, which is indigenous within the, the society of Bardvarsha, or India. <laughs> because 8,400,000 species, 400,000 species are human. How many of the human are actually intelligent? Very, very few. So you have a rare birth, very rare, extremely rare. It's like having a, a, a lot of money and you can do anything you want with it. Now how are you gonna spend it? <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> The intelligent class of human being must take, take a serious note of this, human, this opportunity. Not all human beings are intelligent. So the importance of human life is not always understood. People think, well, I'm a human and I have a body, I have senses, and there's the world out there. The world out there is for my enjoyment. And there's so many ways that I can ex fulfill that need for enjoyment. So that is my focus in life. Therefore, manishina means thoughtful. One who thinks, not just reacts. It's particularly used here. A manishina person like Maharaj Pariksit must therefore take to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and fully engage himself in devotional service, hearing, chanting, etc. of the holy name and pastimes of the Lord, which are all Hari Kitam Ritam. This action is especially recommended when one is preparing for death. Umagyan timiranda syagyana jana salakaya chaksun militam yena tasmai shri gurave maha 
Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pachadine Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakopa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare <laughs> well, Prabhupada was giving a lecture in one country in Africa and he was speaking about uh, the duration of life and then he pointed to one gentleman who was there in the audience and he said what is your age and the man said I'm 22 and Prabhupada said yes you're 22 years dead <laughs> people some think I'm 22 years old but what Prabhupada was saying is that 22 years of your life is gone and that can never be taken back. As time moves on, we move closer and closer to the end of this body. Every second is another second or moment closer to the end of this body. So the body will end at a certain time. We have so much time and each of us is given a certain amount of time in this particular body and how we use it will determine whether we actually achieve success in life or have to come back in another life to try and do it again. Maya davase kacho base kacho ho bubu vai. Life after life after life, the living entity takes birth in different situations. Karanam guna sango syo sadasajoni janmisha. Sometimes good birth. And sometimes even below the human species of life. And Prabhupada would always say, no one can determine what is their next birth. But we can plan for it. <laughs> and we can act in such a way that we cultivate that consciousness that will take us to the world of spiritual consciousness. So when we have spiritual consciousness, when we end this body, we will go to the spiritual world. If we have material consciousness, or even slight amount of material consciousness, then that, that slight amount, whatever it is, Prabhupada said, even one tiny bit of material desire is left at the time of death, that desire has to be fulfilled. So therefore, one is forced, again, to take birth in some situation to try to fulfill that desire. So here is the formula for getting out of the material world and achieving success in life. Sravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smaranam. Hearing, chanting, and glorifying the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the essence of spiritual life in the sense that it's the fast track. Just like when you go into the airport and you're going to the plane, they have different corridors for people to board, to go through the, to go through security. And then they have the regular one, and then they have the fast track. <laughs> the fast track, there's less hassle, there's less investigation, and you're considered to be a privileged passenger because you have somehow or other attained that status by being a frequent flyer. And so, you move faster. So, this is the fast track in the, in the process of spiritual life. To hear and chant the glories of the Lord as the focus of one's activities. And we've been hearing, and because this whole section of the Bhagavatam is based on that same principle. Maharaj Parikshit is now, in, he's inquiring. He's just in a situation where he knows he's going to die in about seven days. This is the first day. And now he wants to find out what is the formula for becoming deathless. He understands the process, and that is to hear 
the glories of the Lord from one who is on the spiritual platform or a pure representative of the Lord. In this case, Srila Sukadoga Goswami. And so he is absorbed. So becoming absorbed is not something that we temporarily do, just like we get absorbed in our service. So we have a particular service we do. So we, we absorb ourselves, and we put our mind, our concentration, our creative thinking, everything that we can, all the faculties that we have, and trying to execute that service. And that's called being absorbed in service. But devotional service means that one should, one should be engaged absorbently in service. <laughs> that means whatever you do, you should be absorbed. Not just, I'm absorbed in this service, and in this service, I'm not so absorbed in this service, it's okay, yeah. It doesn't matter if I pay attention or not so much. But because we, the more we like a particular service, or we might say the more we are inclined to a particular service, the more it's natural to become more absorbed in that. But bhakti is, is complete, that all the activities of devotional service are on the transcendental platform. And therefore, one should practice bhakti in an absorbed way. <laughs> that means whatever you do, do it in that consciousness. And that way, even the smallest little activity that one performs in devotional service brings satisfaction, such as cleaning your room, or maybe cleaning the temple. So we might think that's a menial service. But Prabhupada used to say the word menial doesn't apply to the, con the concept of service, because no service is menial, because all service is meant to be offered to the Supreme Lord. So, but in essence, to get to the fast track of devotional service, the scriptures emphasize Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Krishna Smarana, to absorb oneself in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. Um, Srila Prabhupada has written so many books, <laughs> and so many books are being written about Srila Prabhupada's books. To explain Srila Prabhupada's principles in a more detail and a more from another angle of vision. So that is the duty of those who are followers of Prabhupada is to take his books, understand them, and write about his books without changing the essence, but giving it from different angles of vision. That was what the Goswamis did. They wrote books simply on the prayers that Lord Chaitanya gave them, known as Shikshastaka. And then the Goswamis, they would also write books on the, on the other Goswamis' books. They were called tikas, they were called commentaries, various types of... So, the, this, we have flooded the world, pretty much, with transcendental literature. But devotees don't read. That's the problem. I remember, and, and Naveen Nirda was making the same point in his class two days ago, that devotees don't read. About 10% of our devotees in our movement read the books, and very few actually have the books in their homes. I was at a, a meeting of all of the senior devotees in Mayapur. This was about five years ago, five or six years ago. It was called the ILS, the ISKCON Leadership Sangha. And at this particular meeting, there were 259 devotees who had various types of leadership, leadership position in the society. So during this meeting, there was an idea to take a survey and on that survey, there were the listing of all the books that Srila Prabhupada had written. And you would get a paper with all of the listings, and then you would put a number next to that book, indicating how many times you read that book. Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Char, Nectar Devotion, like that. And so, they handed out the papers, everybody took some time, wrote their numbers, and then, 
in order to get an average, you calculate the different books and the numbers corresponding with that book, and then you add it up, and then you also divide it by 259, because that's how many people participated in the survey. And so you did a survey for each of the books. Uh -huh. What was the percentage of people who read Chaitanya Charitamrita? And so, percent, not so much percentage, but how many times on, a, on an average within the Sangha of leaders read Chaitanya Charitamrita? And it was less than one. Even, not even one time as an average. And for Bhagavatam, it was a little bit higher. And for Chaitanya Char, uh, Chaitanya Chari, no, not Chaitanya Chari, Chaitanya Bhagavad Gita was a little higher, like an average of one or two. So the survey really indicated that devotees don't read, <laughs> or hardly read. <laughs> Our society, we, we, we keep very busy. We have a lot of things to do, right? There's so many services to do. And we're always preaching, so that becomes a need, and preaching is expanding. But in order to stay strong and clear and connected in our spiritual practice, we need to, we need to have that nourishment which comes from Srila Prabhupada's books. Because, and what is that verse? Uh, uh, Shri Guru Charana Padma Kevala Bhakati Sadma Pando Mui Yanhara Prasade Vaya Bhavatari Krishna Prabhupada. What is the next line? Aha Prabhu Koda Doya Deha More Parachaya, right? So that verse is saying, I get nourishment. But where do I get my nourishment? From hearing and reading from the spiritual master, from your vakya. So the spiritual master, in this case, we might say Srila Prabhupada and his followers, have come, and what do they do? They speak, and they write books. And so they don't do it for their own popularity in order to get some name and fame for how many books they've done. They do it for the benefit of the conditioned souls so they can learn the process of bhakti and connect themselves directly with Krishna through devotional service. Now we have to read these books, it's important. And then Prabhupada said, no need read them, but discuss them. Bodhiyantas parasparam katiyantas chimam nityam tusyanticha ramanticha. Krishna speaks this verse from the Bhagavad Gita where he says, the thoughts of my devotees dwell in me, their lives are surrendered unto me, and they derive great happiness and satisfaction in hearing about me and speaking my glories. Now, Krishna, I was reading yesterday, Krishna feels happy when we glorify him because this he knows this is the best thing for us. <laughs> So when we actually take the books and read and repeat the glorifications as given by the acharyas and learn them and offer them back to Krishna in, in devotional service, Krishna becomes very happy. He likes that. And he's satisfied. And when, when Krishna is satisfied, then your, your life is perfect. <laughs> your life becomes perfect. So Prabhupada made so much effort to bring, give the world this knowledge, especially Srimad Bhagavatam. So there is book Bhagavatam and there is person Bhagavatam. And as is explained in the Bhagavad Gita, I'm sorry, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, both are required. Many of us have come because we've read books or met devotees, came to programs, got a book, and we're reading books, we have books. But then again, what is the next step? And Rupa Goswami explains, Adao Strata Saru Sangha Bhajana Kriya. Bhajana Kriya means to take shelter of Krishna's representative and work under his guidance and actually practice, practice, I'm sorry, practice the process 
of bhakti as given by the authorized acharyas, those who are expert. That is the third stage of bhakti. Bhakti has nine stages. Vadasrata means faith. And then Shadu Sangam means coming in the association of devotees, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. When one starts to get a taste and one thinks, oh, I want to make this process my life's goal. And then one starts to search out for a spiritual master. And as Srila Prabhupada said, Tad Vigyu, Tad Vigyar Guru Eva Abhigatsche, that to take a spiritual master is necessary. It's not optional. If you want to become successful in the process of bhakti, so we have to see what state, am I ready for a spiritual master or do I mean, need more time to get, when we say, develop my faith more in the process of devotional service. But in any case, that stage is necessary because by the grace of the spiritual master, means working under his guidance, then the next stage, an art nirvritti, those things that are blocking our spiritual process become destroyed by the mercy of the spiritual master when we follow his instructions. We can't get rid of our anarthas on our own efforts. Our anarthas are like big bar burdens that have been carrying with us for many, many lifetimes. But only by the grace of the spiritual master, when he sees that the disciple is sincerely following his instructions, he offers that devotion to Krishna, and then Krishna is pleased, and then you, you, the path of devotional service becomes wide open. It's easy. So some people think, well, why should I get a guru? You know, I have a direct relationship with Krishna. Yeah, that's true. That's not a false statement. But a guru is necessary. Why? Because we have cataracts. <laughs> And cataracts means the vision is blocked. So some operation is necessary. Or even if you don't have cataracts, the vision is blurred. So you go to the optometrist and he gives you some prescription and he formulates it into a set of glasses. And then you have some glasses and then the external environment is visible. Before them it's foggy, hazy, sometimes not even there. <laughs> so. Although the external environment doesn't change, it's always there, our vision is impaired. So in the same way, to actually see the process of devotional service, to get that clear vision on how to process devotional service, and to awaken our love for Krishna, to take shelter of the spiritual master is essential. It's not optional. And then, when an art is removed, when 75% of our art is removed, and we move, then we become steady, we become fixed in devotional service, and then devotional service becomes susukam kartam avyayam. It becomes joyful. Brahma bhuta prasannatma nasoshati nakangshati sama sarveshu bhuteshu marbhakti lavate pramat that one doesn't hanker, one doesn't lament. Material life is like that. People are struggling to get something. And when they get it, sometimes, many times, it doesn't fulfill their desire for happiness. And so they become unhappy, and then they try again. And sometimes they get something what they like, and, it la and, then, and they get some satisfaction from that, but then after some time it leaves them. So this is material world. Hankering after something, getting it or not getting it, we get it, sometimes it does fulfill, sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes it doesn't fulfill, we lament because it doesn't fulfill, or we get something that we like, and we, we're happy, and then we lose it, then we lament. This is material life. But in spiritual life, none of that is present. Because Krishna is always there, and whatever you do in devotional service remains with you eternally. It's like it is mentioned very continuously, re repeatedly, that whatever you do in your process of bhakti in this life stays with you in your next life, even if you don't finish, even if you finish 
80% of your bhakti, still 20% is not complete. You start in your next life from 80%. For material life, whatever you get, you lose, and then next life you start with zero. <laughs> and you have to work again to do whatever you want to do. So spiritual life is never lost. And therefore, in any execution of devotional service, it's very simple. Krishna says, Patram Pushram Palam Tayam Yomai Bhakti Panasya Titaraham Bhakti Paritam Asnami Prayatatmanaha. He doesn't say, give me a palace, give me a million, a million crores of rupees. What does he say? Just give me a leaf, flower, fruit, water, but with bhakti, with devotion. And I accept. So the process of devotional service is easy in the sense that all we, everything we have is simply there within our, all we have to do is offer our devotion to Krishna in whatever activity we perform. Krishna accepts that and what happens? We get detachment from material life, we get transcendental knowledge and we make progress towards the goal of life. But we need a spiritual master. And so we should think, am I ready for a spiritual master? Uh, what does it mean to accept a spiritual master? Who is going to be my spiritual master? Sometimes people ask that. How do I know who is my spiritual master? How do I find a spiritual master? But it says that when you're actually ready to make that step in devotion, Krishna sends you the spiritual master. It says that when you're looking for God, you get Guru, and when you get Guru, then you can find God. <laughs> because Krishna has set up the system in such a way as that he cannot be approached directly. He's approached to his representative, and that his, his representative is the manifestation of his mercy. Krishna can be very hard sometimes. He requires pure devotion. But the spiritual master can see, even if a person doesn't have pure devotion, if they're trying their best, if they're sincere in whatever they're doing in devotional service, then the spiritual master will say to Krishna, oh, give your mercy to this person. And Krishna will say, that person, my mercy? And the spiritual master will say, no, no, he's actually very, she's actually very sincere. They're trying their best. Okay, because you recommended them Okay, and Krishna agrees <laughs> because he can't say no to his pure devotee because the pure devotee has pure love for Krishna and whatever the pure devotee wants, Krishna fulfills. That is the meaning of the spiritual master. Life becomes, bhakti becomes natural and easy with the grace of the spiritual master. And Srila Prabhupada, sometimes people would ask Prabhupada, there was this there was this, this group of devotees that came to see Prabhupada. This was in in Atlanta, Georgia in nineteen seventy five. Prabhupada came to the temple and devotees from all over America, mostly book distribution parties, came to see Prabhupada. And the temple was full. In fact it was so full that devotees were standing outside looking in the windows. There was no room in the temple. It was so packed. <laughs> And Prabhupada was there and there was such such high energy. When Prabhupada was present, the energy was just, the air was like electric. You know, it was like this electrical feeling that was buzzing in the air when Prabhupada was present. And so Prabhupada gave a really powerful lecture. And then he opened for questions. Sometimes, many times he never asked for questions, but this case, he asked for questions. So one of the questions was given by a book distributor. And the question was, the, the book distributor had the idea that he knew what Prabhupada was going to answer. <laughs> and that's a mistake. <laughs> he was thinking, yeah. So he, his question was, Srila Prabhupada, what pleases you the most? And obviously he was thinking, distributed my books. <laughs> Prabhupada put emphasis on that. But he didn't answer like that. He answered in a more complete way. He said, what pleases the spiritual master the most is that you offer your love to Krishna. 
if you will love Krishna. So he made it clear, that's why the spiritual master is here, is to help us to awaken that love which is natural towards the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Of course, Prabhupada said many things that please him. It's like in relationship to his instructions, he was asked, Srila Prabhupada, what is your most important instruction? And he said, my most important instruction is to chant 16 rounds on beads every day without fail. So he emphasized the importance of chanting the holy name and fulfilling our numerical vow of chanting our rounds. He put that as an emphasis also. So the process of bhakti is not very difficult, but we require guidance. And just like, you know, if you want to go on an airplane flight and you want to travel by plane, you need a pilot. <laughs> to get you there. And the pilot has to also has to know how to fly the plane. He has to know how to take off, he has to know how to maneuver it, and he also has to know how to land it. <laughs> and of course, when you, uh, when you buy your ticket, you, you assume that all of this is there within the pilot. He's qualified because the, uh, the agency is authorized. So when we take shelter of Krishna, and we're looking for to find Krishna. Krishna sends us his pure devotee. Now, if we're looking for something material in our spiritual life, just like people go to guru to improve their spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Rupam dehi, janam dehi, danam dehi, yaso dehi, dehi. That's the program. <laughs> uh, God, God has everything, so I know where to go to get it. <laughs> He's got it. I just have to ask him. For him, it's not a problem because he doesn't need it anyway. <laughs> and he can give it. But that's not bhakti. That's business. <laughs> that's business. And so if you approach the Lord for something material, he may send you a guru who can give you that, <laughs> but not one who can take you back home, back to Godhead. So we, we approach the spiritual master to get Krishna. <laughs> that is the thing. Material things will come automatically by the grace of the Lord. We don't have to ask for them. When the Lord, is, when the Lord sees his devotee is trying to serve him, he also sees what we need in our life, and he makes arrangements for that. He does that. Sometimes we think he doesn't make arrangement, or he makes you wait, or he sees you don't really need this, it's not good for you, <laughs> so he doesn't give it. <laughs> but if you're insistent and you, and you approach the Lord for something material, he might send you a guru who can do that. And most of the gurus nowadays who claim to be spiritual leaders are in that category. People come to them to get some power, to get some relief from material suffering, to get some, uh, I don't know, abilities to do things in this world. They even write books, you know, how to, you know, how to be successful in uh, your occupation. <laughs> so that, that you don't need a spiritual master for. Spiritual master is one who brings you into Krishna. And so, make your, make your desire free from all of these other things. And you'll see, there will be no lack in your material life. <laughs> you'll know when Krishna, when you take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and execute devotional service, as I mentioned, Krishna always takes care of his devotees. He's taking care of everyone. So he gives whatever we need need to live in this world nicely and successfully, happily. Sometimes, if he shows you special, special mercy, and this comes with certain people, not everyone, he takes everything away. Very <laughs> well. Yeah, he says that if he loves you, if he, if he, if he favors you, 
he gives you everything. But if he really favors you, he gives you himself. <laughs> and there's nothing else. <laughs> Prabhupada tells, talks about his own life. He said, Prabhupada was, when he was in India, he had a family. And, uh, and then when he met his spiritual master, he was trying to uh, develop his preaching in India. And he had so many ideas to make his business successful so he could also contribute. But Krishna smashed his whole business, took his family away, and left him with nothing. <laughs> and then he's in Vrindavan. He writes about it. He writes, writes poem. He said, uh, he said I'm, I'm reading the list of names. These are all the people that he knew in life. And they're all gone. I'm just left alone. But I have one thing. I have hope that Krishna is there. And then, of course, he was given the mission to come to the United States, or come to the West, actually, and preach Krishna consciousness. So he said, Prabhupada had five children, three boys and two girls. He had a wife. He had a very successful business. He was. Prabhupada also said he was destined to be as rich as Birla. He had that in his horoscope. He, he could have been as rich as Birla. But Krishna took all that away. And then he came and started to preach. And then he said, after many years of preaching, he had established so many temples. Books were being written and distributed. Money was coming in like crazy. Millions of dollars were coming every year. Many devotees were coming. And so Prabhupada said, yes, I gave up my, my wife, my family, my business, and now I have no wife, no botheration with wife. I got more than 300 children before I only had five, <laughs> referring to disciples. And, uh, you know, I have, as, I, have, I have as much wealth as Birla almost. <laughs> Prabhupada was, he had millions and millions of dollars he was dealing with, opening temples. Well, where did all that money come from? From Krishna. <laughs> Krishna's Bhagavan. Krishna was giving him because he was using it for Krishna's service. How about after some time? He was sitting in one, this was after many years of preaching. He was sitting in a hotel room, very nice hotel room in Los Angeles with many of his senior devotees. And some of those devotees were with Prabhupada when he was in India before he came to the West. Oh, well, after he came to the West, they came to see him when Prabhupada went back to India in 1967. And Prabhupada was saying, do you remember how I lived? I had my, in my Radha Dhammatar temple, he showed us the rooms. Now Prabhupada had two little rooms, and he was living at the Radha Dhammatar temple. And he, sometimes he would have to go to the gas, he used to get his own water for cooking. He did his own cooking. He had a little tiny room with a little cot in there. <clears throat> he said, do you remember how I used to live? He said, I was so happy. <laughs> he was saying, I was so happy. I was just there in, in Vrindavan. Life was so wonderful with Krishna and Vrindavan. <clears throat> but now here I am in the West. I have so many disciples so much money, so many temples, and so many projects. And then he said, I really long to go back to Vrindavan. <laughs> but then he said, for me, that would be sense gratification. <laughs> so what he was he saying, that simple life that he loved so much, being in Vrindavan, simply there in Radha Dhammadar temple, just chanting and, you know, writing, reading, and worshiping the Lord. 
He said, that would be sense gratification because I'm meant to come to the West and do this work. So Prabhupada had so much, but he was always longing for that simple life. But he accepted all of these things that Krishna gave. And what did he do? He spread Krishna, he spread Krishna consciousness around the world. Actually, Prabhupada came here to this area. And he actually came to Bharti Vidya Bhavan, just down the road. And he said, one day, there will be a temple right in this area. He predicted this temple. That one day he said, there will be a wonderful temple of Radha and Krishna in this area. Referring to here. <laughs> now Prabhupada, you know, he... he he worked so hard, spending, giving, expending his health, working tirelessly just to spread Krishna consciousness around the world. But he, he, was, he, was, he knew that this was going to be, please Krishna. And he was completely satisfied. Because for Prabhupada, wherever he was, he was happy. It didn't matter where he was. But of course, being very simple in nature, he always longed for that Vrindavan. He said, Vrindavan's my home. Mayapur is my place of worship. Bombay is my office. <laughs> so where do you work? You work in your office, right? And you live at your, in your home. And you worship in, a, in another place. So that was Prabhupada. So, so he said, Bombay is my office. So he made Bombay really an important part of his project. And now we have so many... Nice temples, so many devotees, Prabh books are going out. Because Prabhupada knew that Bombay would be the heart of India. If we could make all of Bombay Krishna conscious, it would be easy for the rest of India to follow. <laughs> so that's still work, and it's still a, a work in progress. <laughs> so the point is that with the guidance of a pure devotee spiritual master, it becomes really, really easy in devotional service. All we have to do is hear from the spiritual master, try to understand and follow his instructions, and by doing that, serving the Lord accordingly, and then the process of devotional service is nice. And then we don't have to worry. The materialists are always worrying what what I need, can I get this, can I have this? And the most fearful thing they worry about is death. Devotees don't even think about death. They know death is there, but they're so busy engaged in devotional service that they don't even give it much thought. They say when death comes, it'll come according to Krishna's arrangement. Right now my business is to serve Krishna and develop my relationship with Krishna. Like that. The materialists, when you even mention the subject, they change the subject. <laughs> they don't want to hear because they say, oh, let's be positive in life. <laughs> well, what is positive? Positive means real. So death is a part of life, it's real. So it says that, that a devotee doesn't he knows that he'll be in this body for so long and so let whatever time I have left, let me use it to become Krishna conscious. We call it die before you die. Die to those things you don't need and, and accept things that, that are beneficial for your progress towards eternal life, back home, back to Godhead. And devotees are happy. Now the process is very joyful, but Guidance is required because material energy is very uh, precarious, very complex, very difficult to cut through. But with the intelligence, just like someone came to Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, I have so many obstacles in my devotional life. Prabhupada said, you just come to me, I can kick out all of your obstacles. With one kick of my boot, I kick it out. <laughs> In other words, by the grace of the spiritual master, all of the obstacles in devotional service are understood and removed by his mercy if we stay fixed in our devotional service. So to have Krishna is the goal, but to have Krishna's devo pure devotee 
is to have both Krishna and his pure devotee. So it's double, double benefit. <laughs> Not only Krishna, but Krishna's pure devotee. Which is our, as Prabhupada said, when he used to sign his letters, your ever well wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So the spiritual master is the well wisher of the disciple. He acts only for the benefit of the disciple. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Prashna? Questions? Mm -hmm. You have a question? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you for a wonderful class, Maharaj. Maharaj, you were mentioning one point uh, regarding absorption. Uh, when we are performing any kind of devotional activities, one must be absorbed in all the activities what we do. But it is, uh, it is seen in my case that uh, whatever I like to do, I get absorbed in that. But other things, uh, sometimes, yeah, we do it as a part of devotional service, but absorption is not there. So how shall we develop that kind of absorption, even the activities which we don't like? Well, <clears throat> how to be absorbed in even the most simplest things in our day-to-day -day life, which we may just do because they're required to do. Well, when we understand that everything a devotee does is meant to be offered to Krishna in devotion. So we put quality into everything we do. We try to do it in the best possible way. Whether it's speaking to others, whether it's just, you know, running to, to the store to buy something. It might be anything that's quite ordinary and routine. But we know it's for Krishna. It's for devotional service. So that way we can put quality in it. So being absorbed means to Try to do your best in whatever you're doing. Whatever it is, put your heart into it. Try to do it in the best possible way. When you're sweeping the floor, sweep it. Do it really nicely. Don't just try to get it done quickly and do, do it half. So in other words, do everything as an offering to Krishna. And Krishna says that yat karosi, yat anasi, yat jahosi, dadasi, yat, ta yat tapasi, tu konta yat, tat kurusho mararpana. Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer and give away, as well as all sacrifices you may perform, whatever you do, do it for me. So that's bhakti. Mm -hmm. So, it may seem to be not so attractive or absorbing, but because it's part of devotional service, do it the best you can. And you'll, you'll find it, you'll, you'll become satisfied. When you do things just to get it done, a lot of times we don't find satisfaction. We get it done, but the satisfaction doesn't come. But when we do it, with attention and try to make it as nice as possible, there's a feeling of satisfaction that comes with the, with the act. <laughs> yeah. When we're working at our job in our office, we have to do the best we can because we want to raise, we want to do the project nicely so the boss is pleased. <laughs> so but the boss is there. <laughs> That's the spiritual master. So try to do it as nice as you can and you'll feel satisfied in that. Rather than just getting it done because I have to. That doesn't mean take forever to do the thing. <laughs> Some, you can do it quickly or you can do it at your own normal speed, but it should be done with attention. That's the most important thing. Apply your attention to whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm.
Thank you for a very pointed answer, Masraj. Um, and another question which I have regarding uh, reading also. You spoke uh, five years back in ILS when it was asked uh, how many leaders are reading. So, Maharaj, how do we make reading as our regular practice? And uh, that to Shil Prabhupada's books. Because mm. there are many books which are coming and uh, we get attracted to those. So many. <laughs> So we feel, okay, I'll acquire this, I will acquire that knowledge, already whatever is given in Prabhupada's book, that I already know it. So, let me acquire something else. So how do we focus on Prabhupada's Well, if we think we already know it, that's an indication you don't. <laughs> because this knowledge is not so easily... There are so many aspects, there's so many levels of understanding of the, of the knowledge. There's a difference, as I mentioned, a difference between theoretical understanding and realized understanding. The more we come in contact with it, and along, the more we practice it, along with coming in contact with it, the more realization comes. Like, how many times have we heard, you're not this body? I mean, we hear it all the time, right? The second canto, second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna makes that point very strong. But have we, have we actually realized that? There is a level of knowledge that comes by way of realization. That happened to me. I'll give you a personal experience. I was just, I don't know, I was just, I was in America and I, was, I just had finished breakfast and I was listening to Srila Prabhupada speak and he mentioned you know you're not this body and it hit me like 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 a ton of bricks yeah i got it i finally got it in other words i actually understood yeah i'm not this body it was a it was a momentary realization that yeah i understood myself being di distinct from the body it wasn't just words, it was an experience. So, therefore, we can continue to read the same thing over and over and get more and newer understanding of the same thing. But practically answering your question is what I do, is that I make sure I read Prabhupada's books every day, and then I, if I have another book, that I like to read. Sometimes devotees write about the life of Srila Prabhupada. That's nice. Or there are other books written by Srila Prabhupada's disciples who are spiritual masters. And they write interesting books about Krishna's leelas and other topics. And sometimes, so I always make sure I read Prabhupada's book along with the other book, not just the other book. So I feel that then I'm, I'm fulfilling that desire to read these other books, which I think are interesting and helpful, but I stay connected with Prabhupada's books as a, as a duty to my spiritual master and also to learn more and more. No, oh, that's my program. You can try the same thing. If you have a desire, read another book, fine. But keep Prabhupada's books along with that. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any other questions? Here's a question here. Okay, right here. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, in the purport it is said that uh, we identify ourselves with the gross and the subtle material bodies. So and we identify ourselves with? Gross and subtle bo material bodies. Yeah. So in devotional service also, we sometimes identify ourselves with the services. And the point that Krishna is there, is the center, gets in the background. How do you rectify this? Oh, I see. What becomes important is the service. Well, that's a progression, generally. It doesn't have to be, but it's a progression that 
when we begin devotional service, the service becomes the most important thing. And as we purify ourselves through the process of de devotional service, Jai Shishi Radha Gopinath Ki Jai. As we purify ourselves, then it's not so much the service, it's Krishna. So that comes that usually at a later stage where one starts to connect everything with Krishna. And the service becomes the means to connect with Krishna. And then the, the service is, it becomes a, a, a reminder of Krishna. So then Krishna becomes the focus. So in, with an advanced devotee, it's Krishna. For a, for a devotee who is not so advanced, it's the service. <laughs> That's generally how things develop like that. Because in one sense, Krishna is not different than in service. But as we purify ourselves, then we understand that ultimately the service is meant to connect us with Krishna. And then we start thinking about Krishna more. We start chanting his name more. We remember him more. We connect everything we do with him then he becomes the object of our concentration and the service is there also. Before it's the service and then him, now it's him and then the service. <laughs> it's like that. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bhav.